JBS presents a television exclusive, The Dur Show with Alan Dershowitz. Welcome back to The Dur Show. I'm going to start with a trivial pursuit question. Who said the following? Give me four years to teach the child and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. Or a variation of that. Give me the child for the first seven years and I will give you the man. Well, the first of those quotes was attributed to Lenin, the major head of the Communist Party. Give me the child and I will never, it will never be uprooted. So the hard, hard, hard left. The second quote, give me the child for the first seven years and I will give you the man, is attributed to Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the, the Jesuit uh, movement. And that's what I want to talk about today. Today, both the extreme right and the extreme left are trying to get the child and trying to control their lives through public schools, through public schools. I'm not talking about private schools or religious schools. They have certain rights. Um, I went to a religious school. Religious schools have the right to miseducate you. And I think I may have been a victim of, of that right to at least some, some degree. But public schools are different. They're the government. They are paid for by taxpayers. They are covered by the First Amendment, by all aspects of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, no establishment of religion and free exercise of religion. And there is a battle, a battle royal going on now as to who is going to control children in elementary school and in high school. But according to these quotes, at least by high school, it's, it's too late. Give me the child, the first seven years, the first four years. Those are the formative years. My, my wife is a PhD neuropsychologist and developmental psychologist, and she certainly reaffirms the importance of the earliest years of uh, primary education. So what's going on in, in the United States today? Two things. And they seem to be in conflict, but they're exactly the same thing. The first of those things is that following the Supreme Court's decision involving, remember, Coach Kennedy. Coach Kennedy used to go to midfield after the football game and pray to Jesus, uh, Christian prayers. And the Supreme Court said, that's okay. They wouldn't have said that's okay if it was a Muslim uh, saying Muslim prayers. I'm not sure what they would have said if it was a Jew saying Jewish prayers. I know what they would have said if it was an atheist getting up there and saying, don't believe in God. Uh, this football game was won by us. Don't Pray, prayer doesn't work. They would never, ever, ever allow that under any circumstances, even though the United States Constitution says that state actors must be absolutely neutral, not only between religions uh, or among religions, but between religion and non-religion. So after winning a 6-3 decision in the Supreme Court in the Coach Kennedy case, a wrongly decided case, in my view, that uprooted uh, uh, 60 years or more, more actually, of precedent, um, the people on the religious right are now trying to turn that into a decision that authorizes formal prayer in public schools, mandatory prayer before games or, or after games. Um, there's a very good article in the Washington Post just the other day um, about this subject. Uh, and it quotes so many people. A member of the Miami-Dade School Board says, our nation has lost its way in having lost a belief in a higher power. Nations don't believe. People believe, and people have a choice to believe or disbelieve, to believe in one religion or another religion or in no religion. The state, the government, has no constitutional interest in promoting religion, indeed, it is prohibited from doing so. And yet all over the United States, we're seeing this happening. Um, according to the Freedom From Religious Foundation, an organization I would 
happily subscribe to, even though I have some religious feelings, but they're private. I don't think the government should have religious feelings or preferences. Uh, this organization said many districts routinely ignore the string of 1960s and 70s Supreme Court decisions. Those were decisions that said no prayer in the school, no special privileges for religious education. The government can't support religious schools or religious institutions. So these decisions are routinely, routinely now ignored. It's, it's from a constitutional point of view, it's no different than ignoring the desegregation decision in, 19, in 1954. Um, the decisions said that public schools cannot require students to recite prayers, cannot allow teachers to lead students in prayer, and generally cannot promote or inhibit religions at schools. The foundation said that since the 1970s, this organization is constantly fighting back against coaches who lead prayers with students at school or school officials who schedule prayers into the school day. In an average year, school incidents make up 50% of the group's caseload, she said. We're mopping up anyway. It's like whack-a-mole. You put it down one place, pops up another place. Um, you know, it teaches us a lot of things. Number one, the Supreme Court can't really have that much influence on, on individual lives. If people in certain areas really are strongly opposed to Supreme Court decisions, uh, there are ways of ignoring them. That's going to happen, by the way, when the Supreme Court decides next term that race can't be used in college admissions. Uh, universities will do everything in their power to circumvent that. In fact, Professor Lawrence Tribe, my former colleague at Harvard, has already encouraged universities to figure out ways to circumvent that Supreme Court decision even before it's decided. So you can be sure that's a decision that's going to be circumvented. But now we're talking about religion. And I think the important point is that when you talk about religion in America, you are talking about Christian religion. And you're talking primarily in most parts of the country about Protestant Christian prayer. Um, you know, there have been efforts over the years um, to, uh, oh, we'll have Protestant prayer one day, we'll have uh, Catholic prayer the next day, we'll have Jewish prayer the third day. You'll have a friend of mine was involved in that lawsuit. So they came to Jewish prayer and they said, all right, who's a Jew? And six or seven kids raised their hand. And they said, all right, you do the Jewish prayer. And the other kids said, whoa, 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 he's a reformed Jew. I'm a conservative Jew. I want to do the conservative Jewish prayer. And the Orthodox Jew said, no, no, no. I want to do the Orthodox Jewish prayer. So even within a small religion, 2% of America, less than that, you're not going to get unanimity. You're not going to get agreement. You're not going to get agreement within Protestant faith either. The Catholic Church, you get agreement because it's imposed from the top. The Pope says what to do, and, 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 and you do it. But even there, there's very considerable disagreement, not about the liturgy, not about the catechism, not about the prayer, but about you know whether to use birth control, for example. Great, great disagreement. So what happens then is that Christian prayer, um, mainstream Protestant Christian prayer for the most part, but Catholic prayer to some degree, is what's authorized by the school. And, and kids who are not part of that tradition, they feel alienated. They worry. They don't want to be outsiders. Remember, the last thing a 10-year-old wants to be is different from his classmates. And if everybody else is praying, even though he comes from a family that doesn't pray or doesn't believe in prayer, um, he's going to feel alienated. And there are several possibilities. One, he'll internalize it and be very frustrated. And the other is he'll join. He'll join the prayers. And there are, in this article in the Washington Post, story after story about kids who really were coerced into believing. And then they did believe. Now, you know, if my mother were here to discuss this, my mother would say, a little prayer can hurt. Well, it can't hurt if it's your prayer. But if you're a very devoutly uh, religious uh, Muslim uh, or Orthodox Jew and everyone around you is saying a Christian prayer, um, no, uh, that can hurt you. Uh, that can have an impact. And it's an impact that the United States Constitution was written to avoid. Remember, the United States Constitution was written about a country 
where people came to to avoid religious persecution. That doesn't mean they didn't do it themselves. The Puritans obviously imposed uh, religious um, views, but then, you know, people founded uh, Rhode Island, which was uh, a place where people could go. Roger Williams um, uh, allowed people to be free religiously. Thomas Jefferson in Virginia wrote into the Constitution um, all kinds of rules restricting uh, religion. Thomas Jefferson himself believed in God. He didn't believe in prayer. He didn't believe in an intervening God. He believed he was a deist. He believed in God, the watchmaker. He makes the watch and then he lets it tick and doesn't intrude on, on daily life. The vast majority of America's founders were, were deists. John Adams, uh, who was himself uh, fairly religious, um, said that uh, before he dies, uh, most Americans will be buried as Unitarians. Um, and Unitarians, of course, uh, are religious, but they don't believe in the Trinity, and they're very close to Reformed Jews in many ways, and they would not be happy with the kinds of prayers that are said in schools today. And uh, but but you know nobody wants to complain. Why don't rock the boat? Don't don't make a mess. My mother. She used to do a parlor trick. It was a lot of fun. We'd go to a party, and my mother, this Orthodox Jewish woman, very religious woman, would recite the entire Catholic Mass in Latin. How did my mother learn the Catholic Mass in Latin? Certainly not from her parents. But her Irish school teacher thought that part of being an American, and their job was to Americanize the immigrant kids. The Irish school teacher taught these Jewish kids the Catholic Mass in Latin. My mother had a great memory, so she knew the Catholic Mass in, in Latin, and, and she would sing it. She would say it. She would get it all right. I mean, occasionally, maybe she mispronounced something, but she never occurred to her that they were trying to impose not only religion on her, that she wouldn't have minded, but a different religion from the one that she was brought up in. Okay, so that's one side. And, and, and the other side is, is just as dangerous. The other side wants to use public schools to propagandize students, to propagandize them about their conception of racial justice, their conception of gender justice. Their, now, these are views that I tend to to agree with. I'm all in favor of racial justice, of real equality. I'm in favor of transgender rights. I am not in favor of using public schools to impose those views on ki kids who come from a different backgrounds. Uh, I am against prayer in the public schools, and I'm against propaganda in the public schools. Nobody watching this show is going to like me. If you're on the right, you're going to be in favor of prayer in the schools, but against propaganda. If you're on the left, you're going to be in favor of propaganda in the schools, but against prayer. You can't do that. In America, if you're going to be against one, you should be against the other. You know what I'm in favor of teaching in schools? This is going to sound very, very radical. Mathematics, grammar, history, if it's taught ob objectively. Um, that's what schools are for. I want schools to teach my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, my children, my cousins, my nephews, my nieces. I don't want them to teach them what to think. I want them to teach them how to think. I want to have to learn how to be critical thinkers. Everybody should read Thomas Jefferson's letter to his nephew, who was 15 years old. And Thomas Jefferson laid out a whole curriculum for his nephew, Peter. And, and he basically said, look, I believe in God, but I don't care if you believe in God or not. That's up to you. Read widely, read broadly, read in an open-minded way. If you come around to believe in God as the result of your reading, hey, that's, that's wonderful. But if you come around believing that God doesn't exist, that's just as good. And don't worry about getting into heaven, Jefferson said. If there is a God, he's not going to punish you for disbelieving in him. He's going to reward you for going through the process of using your God-given mind to think for yourself. 
you know, that old notion that heaven is a betting parlor and that you're better off believing in God because if you believe in God and he doesn't exist, no harm, no foul. But if you don't believe in God and he does exist, you're going to go to hell. If that's where people go who are doubters, I would like to really join them. I don't want to go to a place where everybody thinks the same. I, I, I live in such a place. It's called Chilmark, Massachusetts. But I don't want to go to a place where everybody thinks the same and you're punished if you have uh, dissenting uh, points of view. So my message to people on the right and on the left is do not try to use the public schools of America to train your children either in the way that Lenin said he wanted children to be chained as a communist or Ignatius Loyola said because he wanted to train students to be good Christians. Mm -mm, not the public schools. The public schools should train you to be good citizens. They should train you to be good thinkers. They should train you to be have a good job. They should train you with all the skills you need. Religion, the church, the mosque, the synagogue, the home, that's fine. Where I grew up, public schools wouldn't teach religion. I didn't go to public school, but I had a lot of friends who did. And then the Jewish kids would go to Jewish school after school twice a week or, or once a week or a Sunday school or something like that. So they got their religion in religious institutions and they got their mathematics in the public institutions. Public schools have to be scrupulously neutral. They cannot be for religion. They cannot be against religion. They cannot be for God or against God. They cannot be for Marx or Lenin, and they cannot be for Trump or Biden. They cannot be people who teach other people how to think about these very, very controversial issues. As I said before, nobody's going to agree with me. Half the audience, you're going to see the letters. Well, it's in my case, it's 90% of the audience will attack me for not wanting prayer in the schools. We should have prayer in the schools. If we have prayer in the schools, there'll be less crime. If we have prayer in the schools, there'll be less wars. If we have, uh, nonsense. Um, and the other half will attack me saying, what do you mean schools have to teach important values like equality? And they have to teach important values like racial justice. And they have to teach important values like gender justice. No, no, no. Again, you get that at home. You get that from friends. You get that from other clubs and institutions you want to join the democratic party and go and go to their events fine not in school you want to join the republican party fine not in school join the naacp join black lives matter all that's okay just don't commit crimes but join any of those organizations but not in school arithmetic reading writing arithmetic now we have to go beyond that we have to teach students how to use computers we have to bring them into the modern world. We have to teach them the basics of economics, the basics of civics. All of that's fine. You teach them that there are three branches in the government, but you don't teach them that the branches should rule a certain way. You let them decide that for themselves. That's what education is. When I taught for 50 years at Harvard, I would tell my students, if I change any of you, from being a conservative to being a liberal or a liberal to a conservative, I have failed in my job. If you're a conservative, I want to teach you to be a better conservative. If you're a liberal, I want to teach you to be a better liberal. If you're a communist, be a smarter communist. I'd probably draw the line at fascism. But um, the, the, the goal is education, not prayer and propaganda. So... I'm very upset and very concerned about the schools. I think the Supreme Court did a terrible disservice to America and to freedom of religion and freedom from religion and free speech by ruling that that coach, who is probably the nicest guy in the world and probably should be hired by a parochial school to coach, but that that public school teacher, that public school coach, the person who picks people to play in the game and benches people and writes recommendations to college, should not be allowed to go to midcourt in the game and essentially invite and thereby coerce students to pray with him. He can pray in his locker room. He can pray in his office. He can pray anywhere he wants. If you believe in God, God doesn't care if you're praying at midcourt in a basketball court or a half court 
or at second base or in, on the 50 yard line. For God, you can pray in the bathroom. It doesn't matter. The only reason it matters is because this coach wanted to persuade his teammates. And some of the coaches, by the way, that are quoted in this article, make that point clear. I want players who have faith. I want players who pray, some coaches are saying, because I believe prayer works. And if I believe prayer works, then if I have pray players who pray, we're going to win. And if I have a bunch of damn atheists out there, we're not going to win. Go to a parochial school. See if people want to go there. Go to a private school. It doesn't have to be a parochial school. That way, at least people have the option of going or not. Public schools are mandatory. People can't afford to go to private schools. So public schools are mandatory. It's a captive audience. And under our Constitution, freedom and liberty require complete and total neutrality. No Lenin, no Loyola, Newton, Einstein. That's who should be taught in schools. Basic subjects, how to think, not what to think. Okay, let's get to a couple of questions. We've got a couple of good ones uh, this time. Okay. Let me get right to the back of the book. No, he can't, meaning Trump can't be prosecuted. He can't because he did nothing even wrong, let alone illegal. I don't care what Democrat dementia adult world you lived in. See, I don't agree with that. I think Trump did wrong things. I think the speech... Uh, on January 6th was very ill-advised. I defend it. He has the right to make it. I opposed his impeachment on the ground that his ill-advised speech is constitutionally protected. Um, yes, he said people should go and demonstrate peacefully and patriotically, but he should have understood that he was unleashing a force that could get out of control. Is it a crime? No, it's not even close. Should he have done more when he saw what was going on? Yes, he should have. You should have gotten on national television. You should have said, stop, go home. This is getting out of hand. This is not what I wanted you to do. He did that. He did it much too late, much too low, and, 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 and much too ambiguously. So I think what he did was wrong. I think what he did was constitutionally protected. I think what he did was not criminal. Again, nobody likes me for that. I'm not looking for popularity. But, you know, people say either... Trump did everything right and he shouldn't be prosecuted, or he did everything wrong and he should be prosecuted. I think he did everything wrong and shouldn't be prosecuted. So that's the way I stand on so many issues. Um, wait, wait, wait. Did this clown, meaning me, just compare the witch hunt after President Trump, who has never committed any crime, to the pursuit after Hunter Biden, just when I think I found a decent liberal? Well, I hope you found a decent liberal, because a decent liberal... Um, applies the same standards. And I think applying the same standards, I would be very, very skeptical of prosecuting any high ranking political figure or child of a political figure, unless there was evidence of crime. And I just don't, I just don't, I just see it at the moment. I have an open mind. If the evidence of crime on either side materializes, I'm happy to reconsider, but not right now. Uh, Realize what Dershowitz does. He presents arguments because he's a lawyer trained to look at all sides of an argument. If you have a better argument, present it. Dersh may or may not give his personal views in his arguments. He always says, if the facts are strong, present them. If the facts are weak, present the law. That is why Dersh is good to listen to, not necessarily agree with. There's usually a third part of that. The, the old statement is, if you have the, to jury lawyers, if you have the facts on your side, bang the facts in. If you have the law on your side, bang the law in. If you have neither on your side, bang the table. And I think too many, too many lawyers do that. There's too much table banging and not enough facts and law. Um, this is a nice one. I don't like you personally, but I think you're smart on legal issues. Um, another one, glad to hear straight talk from an expert. Well, I try my best to give you the experience that I have over almost 60 years of doing this kind of stuff that doesn't make me right. I think it does make me somebody to listen to, but you make up your own mind. Again, I'm not trying to tell you what to think. I'm trying to give you information. I'm not actually in class now, so I'm entitled to tell you what I think you should think, but I try not to do that. 
I tried to explore various alternative scenarios and let you make up your own mind. Hey, Alan, quick question. Are you okay with the Biden administration arming Nazis in Ukraine? No, I'm not. I'm not. And today there was a terribly uh, dangerous story about how the Ukrainian government has been recruiting foreign troops to help defend them against Russia. I understand that. But a lot of the foreign troops who have come to aid Ukraine against Russia are neo-Nazis, are white supremacists. They see this as a mission to defeat the evil empire of Russia. And the article in today's paper indicated that there's great fear among intelligence agencies that these Nazis, and they come with their Nazi symbols, uh, you know, the, 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 the moderate Nazi symbol, the one that just, that, it's not the swastika, it's the variation on the swastika. Um, and then they get trained and they learn how to do munitions and they learn how to do tactics and they, and they go back to their countries and they could head militias that are doing violence. That's what happened with ISIS. Uh, ISIS went and fought in various countries and then came back and had military capacities, which enabled them to do things that were terrible, terrible and terrible. I think Ukraine has to have a rule that no, no Nazi symbols will be allowed. No openly Nazi people will be recruited. And you can't have a litmus test for what people actually believe. But I don't think Ukraine is doing enough to ferret out the Nazis. And there are too many Nazis in Ukraine. Look, it's not a country of angels. Uh, the history of Ukraine is one of the worst histories in humankind when it came to genocide and complicity with the Nazis in the Second World War. One of the worst in the history of humankind. And that doesn't disappear overnight. Yeah, they, they elected a Jew president. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't lingering problems of neo-Nazism, which I think there are in Ukraine. So I'm strongly supportive of Ukraine. I hope they can defeat Russia and make sure that they don't take over their land and don't kill their innocent civilians. But I'm not a fan of allowing uh, Nazi battalions and Nazi people from other countries to come and defend them and then go back. You know, British intelligence is watching planes going into Ukraine from the airport to see if well-known neo-Nazi terrorists are, are, are joining the flights to go to Ukraine. So it's a problem. And again, uh, I look at it in a nuanced way. Uh, I'm in favor of Ukraine, but I'm not in favor of its uh, willingness to tolerate uh, Nazism. Again, this is very similar to what I got a minute ago. Uh, target people, they should go after Hunter and all the Bidens. They are guilty of treason. He was, and then it goes on and on and on. No, you don't target people. You look at the facts. You don't use words like treason to describe allegations of, of corruption. Look, follow the facts, follow the money, see if you can make a case. Don't target people and then look to see if you can make the case. Make the case first, and then it doesn't matter who the target is, whether he's the former president of the United States or the son of the current president. I think the hard question is, and it's a question that a lot of people answer differently, should you apply a different standard? Should it be harder to prosecute a former president than just an ordinary person? Should it be harder to prosecute the son of a president? I think the answer to the first question may be yes, it should probably be harder to prosecute a former president. As to the second question, probably not. And the real question is who decides? It often is who decides. And, you know, should there be special prosecutors because Hunter Biden is the son of the man who appointed the attorney general. I am generally not favorable to special prosecutors, um, but there has to be not only justice done, but justice seen to be done. And I'm a little concerned, a little concerned that if in the end the Justice Department says Trump should be prosecuted and Hunter Biden shouldn't be prosecuted, a very large percentage of Americans will find that decision to lack nonpartisan credibility. But the answers aren't, aren't obvious. A special prosecutor, we have, in effect, a special-ish prosecutor 
from Connecticut looking at some of these matters. Is that enough? Maybe it's enough. Let's see what his report says. Um, I have to say, what a breath of fresh air coming from, shall I dare to say, a liberal? I don't know you per se, only recognize your name from other sources. Public debate, debate, debate. It's the only means of getting, of vetting a public figure. You dodge your opponents on debating them. Tell me you are either a liar or have something to hide. Okay, I agree with that. I think we need more and more debate. Today, the Lincoln-Douglas debate could not occur. Half the country would say, we agree with Lincoln, we don't want to hear from Douglas. The other half would say, we agree with Douglas, we don't want to hear with Lincoln. I want to hear from both sides. I want to hear from all sides. And so tomorrow, you'll hear my side of yet another controversial issue.